Um, I, I, let me just say that this is, I think for all of us, this is um, a work in progress. Uh, and I'm going to be doing it because um, I've just recently finished a book and this has nothing to do with it. So this is really nice, although it's really depressing. Um, anyway, so what am I talking about here? I am interested here in, and you see the image here about Steubenville, about questions about the relationship between sexuality, gender, and social media particularly in relation to sites in which the body and identity itself is at issue, um, sexual identity and sexual violence in this case. So I'm looking at, uh, I, and I'm not 100% sure I'm going to stick only with these sites. Um, I probably will expand because, uh, unfortunately, there are lots of them. Uh, but right now I'm looking at three locations. One is the Steubenville rape case, which I, I assume most of you are aware of a 2012 case um, in which um, two high school uh, football players were accused and, and tried of uh, raping a, a, a passed out and intoxicated 16-year-old um, girl. And that happened in 2012. The Delhi rape case uh, also happened in 2012. Uh, and uh, this is a gang rape case. Um, where a young woman was uh, taken into a bus and, uh, and raped over several hours brutally and uh, died from her injury. And um, so it became, ended up becoming both a, a rape and murder case. You can see why I'm totally depressed by this. And the <coughs> It Gets Better Anti-Bullying Project, which was started earlier, which was started in 2010 um, by gay writer Dan Savage. Uh, when he posted it, he did a, him and his partner did this YouTube video um, that became this huge, uh, viral event, um, and I'll talk more about that. Um, uh, and, and I just should say, with both the Steubenville and Delhi rape case, there were convictions in both cases, um, which is an interesting phenomenon. But I'm interested in how sexual and, and uh, you know, the relationship between sexual and gender violence and sexual identity and social media, and partly because these are phenomenon, both sexual violence and gender identity, and sexual identity are understood to be phenomenon deeply intimate and profoundly social at the same time. Both have prompted political movements and singular narrative strategies. So for example, consciousness raising and telling truth confessionals and the coming out story um, in terms of gay life. Both are also marked by shame and objection. The fear that constructs the closet, the shame that sexual assault provokes. So what happens then when circulation publicizes that which has been hidden? And that's sort of my question here. And I have a bunch of questions. Well, I have many questions, no answers. But let me give you some of the questions or things I'm interested in addressing with this project. How do our normative and hegemonic narratives of sexual identity and sexual assault shift in an era of virality? To what extent does virality enable new and transforming responses to these issues? I'm particularly interested here, actually, in how the mode of virality does or does not change the narrative arc of sexual identity and sexual violence. Are different stories being told because they're being told this way? Wow. Different stories than the stories, you know, the older coming out stories or the older, you know, sort of narratives of, uh, about sexual violence, either in memoirs, either in, uh, you know, it take, it get, you know um, take back the night marches. How are these things different? Uh, are they different? Do they use different ways of storytelling? Do, this, do these new circulations differ from those of earlier generations, both in their narrative structures and in the political and social responses of citizens and state actors? Does watching boys brag about rape while the seemingly unconscious victim is displayed change the national discourse? Even at a moment, and this happened at the same moment in which there was an attempt to defund the Violence Against Women Act didn't happen, but uh, it was an interesting convergence of events. How does the recirculation of these images and their reconfiguration in tweets and blogs shape the discourse? How does the very mode of the viral, the instantaneous and recombinant transmission of images and meaning shape a topic? How does the tangibility of gendered violence, sexual violence, the violence of homophobia and anti-gay bullying, upon the gendered, race, and class body play out when it becomes a viral repetition. So does the injured body become a meme? What happens to embodiment in moments when it, the social media event captures the experience and recirculates it? Why, of course,
course, another question, why do these particular events go viral? Why these? Unfortunately, women are raped all the time, brutally. Gay kids are bullied all the time, brutally. Why, why these things? Why at this moment? So I guess part of the question I'm asking, you know, sort of I could put them in two, two categories. One is how does viral circulation affect affect? Okay? How does it affect affect? But also how does it structure social and legal responses? And that's one of the most interesting things I found in the, the little bit I found already uh, in the difference between Steubenville and the Delhi case is, is, is in the question of effect. So Steubenville, let me go to Steubenville now. So this, is, this case is one in which social media matter most vividly. The very crime would never have been known, even it seems by the victim, if the perpetrators and onlookers hadn't documented and spread it online through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and text. In other words, when she, uh, after she came home or was dropped home, after the assaults, she didn't know what happened to her. She had no idea. So the only way she found out about it was the circulation uh, that these boys had documented various aspects of it, and onlookers had documented various aspects of it, and had posted these as Instagram images, uh, and then, she, and then she, she found them and you know, realized that something had happened. And the Steubenville case, therefore, was mediated from the very moment of the assault. Uh, as I said, there was this Instagram photo that I think most of you have probably seen of the past girl, uh, passed out girl being held up by the legs and arms by her two assailants, which was circulated and recirculated. There was a 12 minute video from the night of the assault which in which uh, various classmates, other uh, football players were referring to her as dead and mocking her and mocking the assault. And there are text messages from witnesses and assailants and the victim. Then it gets even more mediated and more viral. An offshoot of the uh, hacker group Anonymous got involved, and they're the ones, in fact, who leaked that 12-minute uh, video that showed the drunk boys joking about the assault. And most sort of um, contentiously, a crime, a local cr crime, crime blogger, I mean, that's sort of, she focused on crime, uh, Alexandria Goddard posted and, and took screenshots of the tweets before they were removed and deleted from the accounts. But actually, one of the things that's interesting that I found out about the Steubenville case that I hadn't realized when I started looking at it in terms of, of how it's been understood is that we tend to now look at this as, as a moment the social media made. As a, now, and in some ways, that's true. I mean, the social media did sort of make this and recirculate it. Um, but actually, yeah, um, what happened, the order of events was, was a little, you wouldn't, re you wouldn't recognize the, order, the actual order of events from how it is later portrayed by the media. So the order of events sort of went like this. Um, the parents went to the police two days after the attack. So the, the first order was actually this parental intervention. They saw the tweets, they saw the Instagram image through the daughter. They then took this flash drive to the cops uh, containing the photographs, screenshots of the tweets, and this video, um, this 12 minute video. Then, so that was the first moment is that the parents went. Then this blogger, Goddard, got involved. Then, and, and started, you know, uh, sort of putting pressure on the police. Then there, was a big New, then there was a big New York Times piece in December. This happened in August. And then the anonymous group um, got involved. So the anon anonymous got involved after the police had already arrested them, after the police, after the parents had gone in, after the blogger had done it, and after <coughs> the New York Times did it. But it's, in fact, not how you would understand uh, most of how it's been talked about, I think. Uh, and then there was the Occupy Steubenville rallies that occurred later on. So the rallies were the end, the end point of it. Uh, the boys were actually arrested August 22nd, very soon after the incident. Um, and it, it, there, are, uh, there are a number of things I want to I wanna talk about here. One was, and I, I think this is probably the most upsetting for, um, and, and the most different from the, um, the case in Delhi, was that uh, during the trial, there was a, it, so there was all this media circulation that went on before um, pressure from the, this blogger to you know act on it and, and a lot of organizing around it. But most of the of the media circulation actually occurred during um, the trial, when the blogosphere and Twitter in particular um, lit up in uh, antagonism towards the victim. 
so the victim blaming got, got enormous. Um, when outrage, while outrage circulated, what circulated even more powerfully was victim blaming and misogyny. And let's see, this is from the Steubenville, um, from the rally. This is, this is um, uh, the op, op roll, red roll is uh, the hackers. That's what Anonymous did. Printified is the blog from the um, Alexandria Goddard. Who, was, who had lived in Steubenville before, so that's part of how, how she got involved in it. And these are some of the tweets. I have no sympathy for whores. I want to, there's lots of I want to kill you threats. And in fact, two girls were arrested after the trial for threats on, um, on the internet to the victim. Okay, this all happened to the victim. And then of course there was the response to it. There was also a huge other sort of iteration of this that occurred when, um, about the coverage in the mainstream media. I don't know if you remember, but there was a huge thing around CNN when Poppy Harlow was covering the trial and said, during the trial when they were found guilty, there are, and this is quoting her, there are two young men who had such promising futures, star football players, very good students, literally watched as they believed their life fell apart. So this it, it made a huge outrage. It was a change.org petition on it, um, uh, you know, to, to sort of get CNN to apologize because of these attacks. Um, and, and again, people got more involved. So, so what was notable here, I think, are, are two things. One, about this case, one is that the event itself came into light because of social media and viral circulation. Right? Because someone chose uh, uh, to document, uh, or as one, as one writer called it, you know, we now have a, live in a culture of live rape blogging. And because someone chose to document this, um, that actually got, it got made news. But the other part of it that's so striking is that the circulation of antagonism and vitriol towards the victim and the culture of victim blaming that went on and the attacks on the, on the young woman were, were actually the dominant kinds of tweets that went on during the trial and after. Okay, Delhi. So that was a cheery one. Delhi, another cheery one, also in 2012, where this woman, um, the 23-year-old woman, was gang raped on a private bus and then uh, died. Now this set off huge protests in India and abroad. And it's interesting because while social media uh, played a huge role in organizing the rallies and raising attention, it was different, the, the phenomenon was different from Steubenville and what happened in Steubenville in so many ways. First, the physical actions, the demonstrations were far greater than Steubenville. Now, some of this, I mean, there was the Occupy Steubenville rallies, but, but predominantly what went on when Steubenville was a lot of media circulation about it articles and you know, all of this stuff, but there wasn't actually a lot of physical protests. It was a small, uh, and it didn't last that long. Um, now, some of this, of course, is because it was so horrifically violent and the victim died from her injuries. But it also tapped into larger social movements in India in a way that the Steubenville case did not. Um, the women's movement, but also other workers' movements and so on. There were other, the other major difference, which was striking to me, is that when Steubenville happened, there was no, uh, there was no, there was no legal ramification. I mean, there was nothing that was done other than the social, uh, the social media outrage, both in support of the young woman and attacking her. What happened in India was that after the rape, the law was amended to make it more difficult to get off lightly. They widened the definition of rape. They provided for the death penalty. Whatever you think about that, in cases that caused the death of the victim, they created several new offenses, including sexual harassment. They set up six new special courts to handle and fast track rape cases in Delhi. So there was this huge legal, quite deliberate legal response. Um, this is just more of the stupid though. Here's the Delhi. This legal response. What was also important to me to find is that the victim blaming almost it was almost invisible. So this attack, now, is that because she's dead? Is that because it was so heinous? It's, it's unclear to me. Right? And, I'm, and I'm sort of looking at what, what are the, I mean, the, the, the responses were just hugely different. Um, these are just some of the internet responses here.
And there's some evidence that, I mean, here the social media didn't capture the event and intervene as directly as it did with Steubenville, but it played a huge role in political uh, mobilization. Um, there was this Stop Right Now online petition. It was directed to the President and the Chief Justice. But almost all of the vitriol, and there was huge vitriol um, in the uh, in the Delhi case, almost all of it was directed towards uh, the perpetrators. And there were these celebrations. I mean, again, whenever you think about that, there were these celebrations when they were convicted. Now, I could say here, and this is um, um, more, again, that Google and India did, I would say that, that in some ways, I'm trying to figure out why the difference. Right? Part of what I'm trying to figure out is how did this circulate so differently? And is it just about, I mean, on the one hand, I say, well, it's because, is it because in our misogynist world, only a dead rape victim is seen truly as a victim? And I don't, I think there's some truth to that. That part of the reason uh, there wasn't an availability of a discourse of blame for the victim is because the victim was dead. Uh, but, but, but on the other hand, I actually think, you know, when you look at some other cases, I'm not sure that plays out. When you look at the case, for example, of uh, Larry King, uh, a queer uh, youth in California that was murdered by a classmate in 2008. Uh, in fact, and he was murdered, he's dead, right? In fact, a lot of the discourse around that was a discourse of blaming him. A lot of the reporting, a lot of the, you know, during the trial, sympathy, same kind of thing as you see in, in Steubenville, sympathy with the victim, um, I mean, with the perpetrator, and that Larry had brought it on himself by being so, non, so gender non-normative and coming on to this boy. And so there was all of this sympathy for the perpetrator. And so that was, a, so um, you know, one of the things I begin to think is actually that this has something to do with US, <laughs> with US politics and culture. And part of what I'm finding with this, and, and part of the difference I see here, and to it, it and I'll talk in a minute, it gets better, is that the social media becomes the story, and the circulation and the virality became the story of the violence. Whereas with India, it, it is almost as if it became, it, it, it's sort of a means, not an end. Right? It, it became a way to organize people in what much more traditional social movement organizing, to get people out to rallies, to put pressure on the government to act, to put pressure on the government uh, to, uh, to, you know, to deal with uh, questions of misogyny and sexual violence more aggressively, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there was other stuff too, protectionist sort of discourse that was problematic. But it was as if the social media and, and, the, and the way in which it circulated was a tool that was distanced from its, uh, that didn't recirculate as the subject, right? When you look at Steubenville, and of course it gets better, the It Gets Better project as well, part of what I think happened with Steubenville and why you don't see more sort of a social change emerging out of it or social movements being galvanized in a bigger way out of it is that it became the subject itself. So in fact, one of the biggest pieces written on the Steubenville case was written a really messed up piece in the New Yorker um, called uh, Trial by Twitter. So it, that, that in fact, the, the circulation, the social media aspect of it, the virality becomes the subject and in fact, the victim becomes invisible again in a different sort of way. And, and the victim as a, a sort of social position and as women writ large, become, and, and as embodied women writ large, becomes invisible, which did not happen in India, which was interesting. Um, so that, um, now, the It Gets Better, do I have one more minute here? Um, the It Gets Better thing is complicated. Because this, again, it started uh, in 2010 in response to anti-gay bullying and a wave of highly publicized gay teen suicides. And it became huge. Uh, there are now more than 50,000 user-created videos uh, seen over 50 million times. So we're talking virality on a whole other level here. Uh, it became the thing for celebrities and politicians to do to make their own It Gets Better project. And of course, there were spin-offs and debates about it. There was a Make It Better project uh, that became another circulating set of viral videos. We Got Your Back project. And of course, you can also buy It Gets Better bracelets at Cafe Press. And I think, again, part of what's, what's different, let me show you a few <coughs> funny riffs on this. Okay. And I think part of, so, so I think part of what happened, what you see in the difference with this too, <laughs> is that, um, you know, it, it, the It Gets Better fit perfectly into American progress narratives, right? 
you know, queerness is, is a problem that you can leave, as, the anti-gay homophobia, you know, you can leave it aside once you, once you become, a, you know, a, 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 queer, a queer adult. Um, and it, you know, it get this whole thing, and in fact, the whole website is filled with, here are the markers of our progress. And again, I think that's some of what happened with the Steubenville thing. Now we are, that the story of capture, the, of the media talking about this becomes both the beginning and the end of the cycle of investigation. Whereas in the India case, it's just so radically, I mean, to me it was radically different in the way that it actually pushed, you know, it, it was, uh, it wasn't that the social media wasn't uh, in, engaged with it, but it was really um, in the sense of a, of a tool uh, very analogous to other tools uh, we would have had many years ago about getting the word out uh, about what it was. It was not seen as an end in and of itself. Um, anyway, that's that's where I am with this. I, you know, I now I'm, I'm sort of looking at whether I'm going to investigate some of the other cases that have happened uh, in the U.S. in particular, alongside this. You know, now does appear to be a phenomenon. Uh, of people recording on various forms of social media and posting very, on various forms of social media uh, their attacks against women. Uh, and there was a case in, was it Missouri, I guess, that was not too long after the one in Steubenville, which is, is scarily similar in terms of the, the, you know, the desire by the perpetrators to in fact advertise uh, their crimes. Um, but, the, but again, you know, how, uh, it, I, I'm, I'm also interested in looking at some more cross-cultural comparisons because I find it, it, it the, how it played out couldn't have been more different, and particularly this question of victim blaming, which seems so absent. Not absent, not absent in, in Indian culture writ large, but absent in this event, which is an interesting thing to look at. So, thank you. Oh, thank you.